is my Lord and my God. And we are studying the Gospel of John now, John chapter 1. Uh, today we'll begin the process of introducing the, the Gospel of John to you and getting into chapter 1, verse 1. But my Lord and my God, the Gospel of John, beginning in chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, where the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Well, it gives me great joy. It's just a tremendous blessing to be able to study this gospel together and to be able to start today. Our practice, week by week, is just to go verse by verse by verse through the scriptures, to understand what the Bible says, what God teaches us in his word. Again, you don't want to hear my opinions, right? You want to hear what the Word of God has to say. I don't want to hear my opinions. I want to know what the Word of God has to say. And it's just a, a great blessing that we get to invest time beginning today, walking verse by verse through the Gospel of John. This is a, a tremendous honor, and this is a tremendous book, a tremendous Gospel. Andreas Kostenberger has said that John's Gospel, together with the Book of Romans, may well be considered the enduring twin towers of New Testament theology. Martin Luther, he exclaimed the same kind of sentiment when he said that we could lose all other books of the Bible and that Christianity could be saved with John's gospel and the letter to the Romans. And many across the centuries have called the gospel of John the holy of holies in the New Testament. And it is here in this gospel that the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is fully and dramatically displayed, unlike any other place in Scripture. You've come in the Gospel of John to the Holy of Holies to see the glory of Christ. And if you're a Christian, that's what you want, amen? We want a vision of the glory of Christ, and we need to live day by day by day, from glory to glory, from faith to faith, with that vision of Christ by faith. We need to see Christ in this Gospel. I remember as a new Christian, fresh out of the oven, hadn't been saved very long, and I just started reading Scripture, and I came to the Gospel of John, uh, and man, it, it overwhelmed me um, to read it. Just a new believer, all the stories, all the accounts, um, it's here to see Christ. You just get swept up with the narrative, you know, swept up with the accounts, swept up with the, the last three years of Christ's life that is portrayed here. And I remember uh, coming to chapter two and just being completely captivated by Jesus Christ taking a whip of cords into the temple and driving out those wicked money changers, right? Uh, and seeing his zeal for the house of God. I remember coming to chapter three and seeing the account of Jesus talking about the new birth with Nicodemus and just being amazed by that. Uh, I remember the Samaritan woman in chapter four and thinking that in Christ talking to her, she comes to the realization that the Messiah is here and that she stands there talking to Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. It's just an awesome account. Uh, the man born blind, uh, raising Lazarus from the dead, of uh, the many in John chapter 6 that forsook him, that followed him no more. They had followed him and followed him and heard a hard saying, and they all turned away from him. And in chapter 6, he turns to the 12, and he says to the 12, do you want to leave me also? Just the, the tragedy of that, the disappointment of that. Um, the seven miracles of Christ throughout the Gospel of John. The seven I am statements, so powerful, claiming the deity of Christ. And we come to chapter eight, verse 58, and just gripped by the narrative when Christ says, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And the Pharisees took up stones to stone him. His teaching on the vine and the branches and how believers are to abide in him in John chapter 15. The work of the Holy Spirit, convicting this, the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment in chapter 16. The, pre, the high priestly prayer in chapter 17. And knowing in reading the account of the high priestly prayer that it was during that prayer that Christ also prayed for me. And prayed for you if you're in Christ. It's an awesome account. His arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, chapters 18 and 19. Coming to Doubting Thomas in chapter 20. And doubting Thomas, having placed his hand in his side and the nail scars in his hands, proclaiming, exclaiming, my Lord and my God. And thinking of myself in that, reading it for the first time, how many times I had go, to go back to Jesus Christ to be restored, uh, doubting. And then the last chapter of Peter, restoring Peter, having breakfast by the sea 
And after Peter had denied him, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ very graciously, very mercifully restores Peter. And I'm reminded how often I have to be restored, how often we have to repent. And then I'm just amazed at the ending, the ending where John says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. It's an awesome account. It's an awesome book, an awesome story. And reading it again and again and again over the years and reading it again now as we prepare and studying for this gospel and going through this together, uh, just as gripped, just as awed, just as fired up reading it now as I was back then when I first read it. This is a, the Bible is an amazing book. One of the reasons that the Bible is an amazing book and the gospel of John is such an amazing gospel, such an amazing account, is because it's about an amazing person. It directs us gloriously to Christ, puts our eyes on Christ, places our faith in Christ. Uh, it is pointing to an amazing person. First and foremost, John is not simply writing a biography. He's not simply writing a historical account here. John is writing a gospel. And in writing a gospel, it's written in such a way to present Jesus Christ in such a glorious way that people believe on him and are saved. John sets about to present facts, but these are not merely facts. These are facts of the faith. These are facts of faith, which are to be believed. And that faith by the grace of God is that faith, faith which leads to life, eternal life, in him and life more abundantly, as John says. If we wanted history, or if we wanted a biography, we could go home and watch a documentary. <laughs> now, this is not a documentary. This is not a simple book of facts. We're gathered here today because of the conviction that the gospel of John, that this book, this Bible, is more than that. This is good news that can change your life, that can change your eternal destiny, and it is to be believed upon. As a gospel, John is not merely writing to introduce you to a concept. He's not merely introducing you to an ideology or a system or a philosophy or a belief or an idea or an isolated set of facts. You in the gospel of John are being introduced to a person. According to chapter 20, verse 31, John's purpose for writing is to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing on him, you may have life in his name. A.W. Pink said this, he said, in this book, we are shown that the one who was heralded by the angels to the Bethlehem shepherds, who walked this earth for 33 years, who was crucified at Calvary, who rose in triumph from the grave, and who 40 days later departed from these scenes was none other than the Lord of glory. And this Lord of glory, who stepped out of heaven, took on the mud of humanity, traipsed through the filth of this world, and as Paul said, came into the world to save sinners. However, the Gospel of John is not only written to unbelievers. Believers, too, have to go on believing in his name. And believers, it says, have to endure to the end to be saved. And so the Holy Spirit, through the pen of John, teaches us that we must abide in him. John 15, 6 says that if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Christians have to abide in Christ. If you don't abide in the vine, then you're cast out as worthless to be burned in the fire. You prove you were never of the vine to begin with. Doesn't mean that you lose your salvation, but Christians have to abide in Christ. The Holy Spirit then through John, through this gospel, doesn't only intend to evangelize unbelievers, it, it intends to awaken faith in the unbeliever and sustain faith in the believer. And one person said, there may be no better book in the Bible than the Gospel of John to help you keep on trusting and treasuring Christ above all. This is a glorious gospel, a glorious book, very helpful for Christians. Martin Lloyd-Jones has said, many who are Christians fail to show forth the glory and wonder of it all. And this is important not only for our own sakes, but still more because of the state and condition of the world that is round and about us. Christians tend to be their own worst enemies when it comes to being a testimony for Christ. We need a reminder of what it is to follow Christ. We need the motivation of Christ himself to help us live the Christian life by faith and obey him and live for him such that we give a good testimony of the work of Christ in us to a lost world that needs a savior. All Christians need to constantly focus faith on the work and person of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
for themselves, for their own good, but also for a testimony to lost people. For that reason, the Gospel of John, the Bible, can't be read simply with your head. It has to be read also with your heart. This is a book that has to be read with a heart as well. As we study together, we need to exhort ourselves in this. As we go through these verses together and spend a considerable amount of time working through these verses, we must exhort ourselves to read, to see the glory of Christ, to see him week by week as the savior of sinners. And not considering it robbery to be equal with God, as the Bible says, but making himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. We must exhort one another in the pages of this gospel to have fellowship with the Lord together. There's fellowship with the Lord in this as we see his compassion, we hear his prayer, his beating heart for sinners, his glorious claims as we witness his suffering. And meditating on the truths of this gospel will compel the Christian to bow his heart in worship. As Paul said, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. And we're going to see all of that in the Gospel of John as we work through. Listen, you don't need psychology to make you happy, right? You don't need worldly reasoning to guide yourself through the difficulties of this life. You don't need your mama when you get discouraged or disappointed or downtrodden. You don't need a psychiatrist when you lose your joy, your strength, or your hope. You never find real security in a job. You'll never find well-being in wealth. You'll never find freedom from the guilt of your sin in trying to be a good person. You'll never find peace in the passing pleasures of this life. You'll never have a clear conscience in mere morality. You'll never have consistency in the Christian life in your own strength. You need Christ, and you need him high and lifted up. And the Gospel of John does just that. You need Christ, as it says in Ephesians 3, to dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We need a vision of the risen Lord, and we need to live for him. You need to be persuaded afresh of who Christ is and what he has done. The Christian needs that daily, and we find that in God's word, and we find it here in the Gospel of John, that you may cry out with Thomas at the culmination of it all, my Lord and my God. That's the Jesus Christ that we worship. That's who we serve. That's who we live for. In the Gospel of John, we're to look to Christ with wonder with amazement and awe at who he is and what he's done as we read not just with our heads but with our hearts. John Stott once said that many people are pygmy Christians because they have a pygmy Christ. You're a little Christian because you have a little Christ. You need a vision of God, a vision of God in the flesh, Christ Jesus our Lord, and you need to follow him by faith. You need a glorious vision of the Lord. And there is no more glorious vision of the Lord in Scripture than in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, Christ towers as Almighty God in the flesh. And we say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. Not the object of speculation, but the object of our adoration. Not the object of a debate, but the object of our devotion. Not an object to be worked out, but the object of our worship. Bruce Milne says that if Christ shares the nature of God, then we are called to worship him without cessation, obey him without hesitation, love him without reservation, and serve him without interruption. To him be the glory forever. Amen. My Lord and my God. So let me give you some background to this awesome book. The Gospel of John, as we've said, has been written to believers and unbelievers alike. It's written to an, a universal audience, so to speak. Uh, this Gospel, number two, would have been circulated in churches made up primarily of dispersed Jews or diaspora Jews, Jews in the dispersion. Why were they dispersed? Because of great persecution, great persecution that had broken out, and it would have been written to Gentiles. So now, let me ask you a question. How would John 
have expected that this gospel, being written partly to unbelievers, how would he have expected that this gospel would reach unbelievers if he was circulating it to churches? Evangelism. Thank you, brother. Evangelism. These churches evangelized. They loved the Lord. They wanted to see lost people saved. They wanted to see people come to faith in Christ. And so they were fiercely, fervently evangelistic. And so this would have reached to even lost people outside of the church by the faithful evangelism of the church. Number three, his purpose for writing is to prove, as he says, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing you may have life in his name. That you would be drawn, his purpose is, to worship, to exclaim by saving faith, my Lord and my God. The synoptic gospels, as they're called in the Bible, are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called synoptic from a compound Greek word meaning viewed together. They have much of the same material, and so they're viewed together as an account of the history and life of Christ. These gospels have similar material. The gospel of John, not one of the synoptics, but the gospel of John, 92% of what's written here is brand new material, material that's not contained anywhere else. And so this is unlike what is found in the synoptics. And unlike the synoptic gospels, which give a, an earthly account of the history, the life of Jesus, John's gospel really is more of a heavenly account, it really is more of a, a heavenly perspective. It's, if you will, God's perspective on who Jesus Christ is. And it focuses on the deity of Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the second person of the Godhead. Number four, it's based on the weight of evidence that this gospel was written late, probably after the destruction of the temple in AD 70. In AD 70, the Romans came through and destroyed Jerusalem. And this was likely written after that, most likely in the early 80s AD, so still very close to the time of Christ. And it was likely written while John was in Ephesus. We just studied 1 Timothy, where we studied the church there in Ephesus. Number five, despite liberal arguments to the contrary, the Gospel of John was written by John, the Apostle John, the disciple John, the disciple of Christ. He had an older brother named James, and together John and James were the sons of Zebedee. And with their father Zebedee, they were fishermen. Until they met the Lord, the Lord saved them, and they became fishers of men. And they, early in the scriptures, called sons of thunder because they were very zealous for the Lord. There's an account in Luke 9 of Jesus uh, walking through a region of Samaria. The Samaritans reject Christ, and so John and James, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, ask Christ, you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume, consume them like Elijah? And they wanted to call out fire out of heaven. They were sons of thunder. Their mother was Salome, and Salome was the one who came and asked Jesus at one point if her sons, James and John, could sit on either side of Christ, his right hand and his left hand, in the kingdom. It's interesting here that John never refers to himself by name in the gospel. Uh, we see him most often by his name appointed to himself as a disciple whom Jesus loved. I always thought when I, when I first read through the gospel of John and I saw that name, the disciple whom Jesus loved, I couldn't help but think a little bit that that sounded prideful, it sounded arrogant. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved, as if he loved John at the exclusion of all others. But it's interesting if you look at that statement, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the name that John gave to himself in the gospel, that the word there for loved, he could have chosen several Greek words, but the Greek word that he chose, agapao, says more about the one who is loving than the one who is loved. And so what appears on the surface to maybe be a statement of pride really is a statement of great humility. John walked around in amazement, in awe, that Jesus Christ could love him, a sinner, like that. It's an unconditional love, it's a fervent love, that Jesus Christ could love him. It's actually a statement of great humility. It shows that John was just in amazement. We need to have that same amazement that God in Christ would love me, would love you, wretched sinners. Turn with me to John chapter 17. Let's just get a glimpse of that. John chapter 17 of how God in Christ loves us. And this amazed John, amazed John that this was even possible. Look beginning in verse 20, John chapter 17, verse 20. 
And here, Christ's high priestly prayer to God. Listen to what he prays. He says in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us and that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. You want to know how Jesus Christ loves those who are in Christ? He loves them like he loves the Son. Isn't that an amazing thought? You, a wicked sinner, an enemy of Christ by your wicked works prior to being genuinely saved, now in Christ, and the Lord looks at you as not guilty, looks at you in Christ, and loves you with the same love with which he loves the Son. It's awesome. Where it goes on in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me uh, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. If you're in Christ, the Bible says that God foreloved you from before the foundation of the world, right? Verse 25, it says, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. It's an awesome thought. This is the way that God loves you in Christ, the way that Christ loves you. Uh, it's an awesome statement. And it just amazed John. It should amaze us that despite your sin, that just based on the grace and mercy of God alone, that God in Christ would agapao you, a redeemed sinner, my Lord and my God. Lastly, uh, it bears repeating, bears stating that this book is inspired, that it's infallible and inerrant. And it says this in the gospel of John itself. Jesus said in John 14, verse 26, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. In John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus says, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. So in other words here, Jesus called the disciples to himself. He chose them, he saved them, he taught them, and then he gave them the Holy Spirit who wrote the inspired scriptures through them. It wasn't the apostles who were inspired, it's the Bible, the word of God that is inspired. And this is God's revelation to us. As such, it is infallible. It is inerrant, without error, it's inspired by God. And that becomes more and more and more evident as we go through this gospel together, as we study this, this gospel together, becomes more and more evident. This is an inspired, infallible, inerrant book. That becomes more self-evident as you study the Bible. Martin Luther said, I've never read a book written in simpler words than this one, and yet the words are inexpressible. These are simple words. They're simple phrases, simple language, but absolutely burst with importance, with profound meaning. One person described it as a pool. The Gospel of John is a pool in which children can play, but it's also an ocean in which elephants can run. This has great importance and great simplicity. And it all begins with a prologue. It begins with a prologue in John chapter 1. And the prologue runs in John chapter 1 from verses 1 through 18. Verses 1 through 18. And the prologue here to the Gospel of John is the introductory material to the rest of the gospel. The prologue, if you will, is the front porch on the house, house, but it's more than that. The prologue to the gospel of John is like a mansion at the front doorstep of an incredible mansion. Uh, and we're gonna just take up our time studying all of that together. It's a, it's a feat that we're undertaking here. This prologue includes all the framework for the gospel that comes after it, such that as we go through the gospel, we're just gonna pack concrete in around that framework. The prologue, these first 18 verses are the skeleton, and we're just gonna put sinews and flesh on that skeleton as we go through the gospel together. And this is very important. The purpose of the prologue section, as is the purpose of the book, is simply to explain who Jesus Christ is. 
He starts right away in the prologue laying the foundation of who Jesus is so that we can have fixed in our minds from the beginning of this gospel the eternal glory and majesty and dominion and power and deity and reality of Jesus Christ so that we exclaim with Thomas as we go through, my Lord and my God. This is a very important section. There are many conceptions about who Jesus is today. And the Gospel of John sets this clear in profound effect, profound statements here. Many would say that he's simply a prophet. Jesus Christ is nothing more than a prophet. Many would say that he's simply a great example of the moral life that we're to live. Some would say that he's somehow divine. He's above normal men, but still a created being. He's just elevated above normal humanity. Often people would say it's not so much about his person as it is about his ideas or about his teaching. There's respect for Jesus. People give him lip service. There's regard for Jesus. Many would say that he's a great man. That's as far as they would go. Deepak Chopra sees Jesus as a state of consciousness that we can aspire to, whatever that means. The Dalai Lama says that Jesus is either a fully enlightened human being or a very high spiritual realization, whatever that means. Mahatma Gandhi, listen to this. He was certainly the highest example of one who wished to give everything, asking nothing in return, and not caring what creed might happen to be professed by the recipient. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, if you just believe him, if you just... You know, he's giving you everything. He goes on to say, I am sure that if he were living here and now among men, he would bless the lives of many who perhaps have never even heard of his name. If only their lives embodied the virtues of which he was a living example on earth. Listen, your life can never exemplify enough virtue to get you into heaven. Your life can only possible in its greatest exertion Provide enough virtue to get you into hell. And your good works are as filthy rags, the Bible says. We see this same kind of thought process embodied in American culture in the likes of Theodore Roosevelt or Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson denied the miracles of Christ. He denied anything supernatural in the Bible. He literally took his Bible and he cut out pieces of his Bible that he thought were irrational. And then he pasted pieces into a book that he had published. Eventually, Congress published the book and called it The Life and Morals of Jesus. And Jesus was just a figure of an example of morality. Later, he had his own Bible published. How would you like to do that? Publish your own Bible. He had his own Bible published called the Jefferson Bible with all that stuff cut out of it. These uh, conceptions of Jesus are not biblical conceptions of Jesus Christ. This is not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. You understand that we're talking about two different people. If you're not worshiping, this is why it's so important. If you're not worshiping the Jesus Christ that is presented here in John's gospel, you are worshiping an idol. You're worshiping a figment of your own imagination, a Jesus of your own making. So what about all those who believe that they can continue in their sin and that Jesus will simply forgive them. They're worshiping an idol. Those that believe that they can live in their sin, continue in patterns of unrepentant sin, still continue to call Jesus Christ their savior and believe that they'll somehow make it into heaven. When John himself says, little children, do not be deceived. He who says, I know him, does not keep his commandments. John says is a liar. What about those that believe that Jesus makes no demands on their life to deny themselves, to take up their cross and to follow him? They're worshiping an idol too, worshiping a savior of their own making. Additional to this, there are the cults. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is the archangel Michael, that he is a created being. The Mormons believe that Jesus is Satan's brother, Lucifer's brother. Uh, and such blasphemy from the Mor Mormons. Listen to this. The Mormons say, as man now is, God once was. Do you believe that? As man, let that sink in for a minute. As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may be. This is blasphemy. One is Pentecostalism. One is Pentecostalism teaches that Jesus is just a manifestation of the Father. That God the Father is Jesus and God the Father is the Holy Spirit. It's called modalism. 
Needless to say, they have no idea what to do with Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan. You've got Jesus in the water, the voice of God the Father coming out of heaven, and the Spirit of God descending as a dove. What do you do with that? We're not talking about the same Christ. Who Christ is, is a hill to die on. Who Christ is, is critically important and extremely exclusive. It has eternal ramifications. It wasn't that long ago, after a conversation with, uh, that Billy Graham had with Mitt Romney, that the Billy Graham uh, organization pulled Mormonism from their list of cults on their website. And the justification that they gave for that was that they didn't want to get into theological issues. As John MacArthur said, they give honor to the false Christ of Mormonism while dishonoring the true Christ of the Bible. One of the first attacks that had to be fought off in the early ch church was against a heresy by a man named Arius. The heresy came to be known as Arianism. A lot of these heresies are named after the person who authored the heresy. It was the council at Nicaea in 325 AD that called this belief that Christ was a created being heresy. Christ isn't a created being. From the beginning, Satan has focused his attack on the identity of who Christ is. And that's with good reason. Uh, these heresies that sought to challenge the identity of Christ are a dime a dozen. There was docetism, modalism, monarchianism, monophysitism, Nestorianism, Sassianism, Sabellianism, subordinationism, tritheism, ism, 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 all focused on attacking the identity of who Christ is as clearly defined in the Gospel of John. And why is that so important? Jesus is not just a great example. He's not merely someone to respect. He's not just a good person or someone who blindly forgives with no repentance and sweeps sin under a rug, turning a blind eye to sin. He is not created. He is not less than God, nor is he simply a manifestation of God. This is enormously important. This is eternally important. It's internally important that you believe that Jesus Christ is not simply an enlightened man or that he is not God in the flesh. John 8, 24 says, for if you do not believe that I am he, Jesus says, you will die in your sins. That's why it's important. That's why you cannot be a Christian and deny the deity of Christ. You cannot be a Christian and deny the Trinity. You cannot be a Christian and deny that Christ is 100% man and 100% God. We don't understand it, but we can't deny it. It's what the Bible teaches. And if you don't believe that he is, then you will die in your sins. You cannot be a Christian and deny the virgin birth, that Christ was raised from the dead. These are, these are essential Christian doctrines, hills to die on. You've not properly understood the Christ of the Bible until you, or unless you, have seen him with the eyes of faith, the way that John, the disciple, describes him here and have been compelled to worship him, falling on your face and crying out with Thomas, my Lord and my God. This is the Christ of the Bible. John is gonna be de begin this description of Christ using a, a powerful but a very necessary method, all right? He's gonna begin by describing him. It's interesting that in the prologue, John doesn't mention Christ's name until verse 17. Now put yourself in the shoes of a first century Jew or Gentile who is maybe reading this gospel for the first time. You'd have been from verse one riveted at who he's talking about. Who is this person? Who's this word? Who is John describing? And it is powerful for John to describe him here rather than just mention his name and tell you out front who he is. Uh, unlike you and I, when we begin to read John's opening words here, we know exactly who he's talking about. They wouldn't have. And then here's how this works. If somebody says to you, do you know Mark Brashear? And then they describe me as some short, skinny, good-looking guy. <laughs> you know that we are talking about two different people, right? Stop laughing. Uh, <laughs> I'm defined by my name in as much as my name accurately reflects a set of attributes that clearly and accurately define me, who I am. In other words, this is why 
Islam and Christianity are not worshiping the same God. Islam can say he's God. We can say he's God. We're not worshiping the same God. We're talking about two different gods because of who God is to Islam and who God is to Christians. There's some famous hockey player named Mark Brashear. I'm not that guy, even though he has the same name, right? So let's see, let's see how this works. Let me see if uh, you can tell who this is. See if you can tell who this is. Are they Hebrews? He says, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I'm more. In labors more abundant, stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Night and day I have been in the deep. Who are we speaking about? Apostle Paul, right? And isn't that description so much more powerful, so much more profound than his name alone? It speaks volumes about Paul, doesn't it? That's what's meant here. What if I describe this person to you? The least of the sons of Jesse killed the Philistine champion, anointed by Samuel to be a successor of Saul as king over Israel, got himself in a whole lot of trouble about a woman on a balcony. <laughs> Who am I speaking about? David, right. That's how this works. That says so much more about David. We understand so much more about David from his life, from his description there. John basically does the same thing here with Jesus Christ. In the prologue, we want to see, John wants us to see that Jesus is both Lord and God. And in doing this again, he begins immediately to fulfill his purpose in writing. He wants to convince the true sinner, convince the true sinner of the true person of Christ, the second member of the Godhead, proving that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life, eternal life in his name. To have eternal life, you must believe on the true Christ of the Bible. And so John lays out a description of the true Christ of the Bible right here in the prologue. Not a misrepresentation of Christ, not a philosophical conception of Christ, not a worldly understanding of Christ, but the Christ of the Bible. And John means for us to read this gospel worshipfully as we come to know him this way, humbly, submissively. It's in awestruck amazement as we follow his account that this is God in the flesh who was the man at the wedding, who was speaking with the woman at the well, who was at the temple, on the hillside, in the boat. This is the creator of the universe who became flesh and dwelt among us and gave his life, laid down his life for sinners. That's the Jesus word to know. In John 11, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked Martha the question, Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe it? If you believe, believing, saving faith, you'll have life in his name. She said to him, verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who has come into the world. The belief that Jesus speaks of there is saving faith. It involves a trusting in the Lord alone to save you. Not in your works, not any good that you can do. Trusting the Lord alone to save you. Your good works don't matter. You've got to turn to Christ in faith and be saved. You can never be a good enough person. You can never do enough good works to merit heaven. Only Christ was good enough. Only Christ was perfect perfectly satisfying the just demands of a holy God so that you, repenting, putting your faith in him, might in him flee the wrath of God, flee the justice of God and get mercy so that you can be in heaven with Christ for all eternity. It is only the risen Lord, God in the flesh, that can compel this kind of devotion. Charles Wesley writes of it in this hymn, where Charles Wesley says, Thee, Lord, I shall constantly proclaim, though earth and hell oppose, bold to confess thy glorious name before a world of foes. His only righteousness I show, his saving grace proclaim. Tis all my business here below to cry, Behold the Lamb. Happy if with my latest breath I may but gasp his name. 
Preach him to all and cry in death, behold, behold the lamb. This is the God of John, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Take a few moments and pray that the Lord would apply these truths to our hearts and we would glorify him in this. Father in heaven, thank you for this time together. And God, please, I pray by your spirit that you would, God, give us a clear portrait. God, open our eyes, our hearts, our ears to understand. Uh, It's a clear portrait of who Jesus Christ is. God, may we be caught up in the excellencies of Christ, the pearl of great price, the treasure hidden in the field, the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world who laid down his life for sinners like me, like my brothers and sisters here. God, glorify yourself in our study of your word. Glorify yourself in our view of Christ as we walk through this gospel. And God, thank you for your great grace and mercy in the time that we can invest to do this. You're so gracious, Lord, to not leave us without a revelation of yourself, but to to give us this portrait of Christ in the Gospel of John. And I pray, Lord, that we'd be faithful in looking to Christ by faith. If there's anyone here, God, that isn't saved, I pray that you would break their heart over their sin. sin. They would mourn their sin. As James says, that they would lament and mourn and weep. They would see Christ as precious, as a true treasure, and turn to him by faith and be saved. I glorify ourselves in our worship of you and thank you for this time. Thank you for this church. God, continue to bless us, keep us, preserve us, strengthen us in your word by your spirit for your glory and for your praise and everlasting worship. We pray in Christ's name, our great God and Savior. Amen.